had to have, uh, um, as it was, you know, it didn't have a storm that night. So, uh, but anyway, it looked like it though. So anyway, uh, this is our, uh, final session for uh, mental health and, uh, Deb just handed me some uh, fun facts, no and tell. These are all being, this is both being live streamed as well as being uh, recorded. And uh, the uh, mental health <clears throat> forum that was held uh, in May of last year, we've had 178 views. The suicide one has had over 230 views. Uh, education resources, 43. And then uh, resiliency and substance use disorders are both close to 150. So point is, is that uh, while we have a small group tonight, we're looking forward to having this taped and people can view it. And uh, I shared before that I was really excited that Scott agreed to come up and, and talk. Uh, I heard him speak, <clears throat> oh gosh, it was a year and a half ago, I think it was, um, just about civility and governance. And uh, so this is going to be a great opportunity to interact. So I'm going to let Scott introduce himself and maybe tell his story and get going. And he said, we're going to have some interactive uh, um sessions uh, are they graded scott or not, not graded. okay Whew. that's good i'm not done with good. i'm done with that so anyway with that uh scott we'll uh, let you uh, take it away thank you You better there you go oh good okay so there we go so for those of you at home on the live stream if you are watching uh there are going to be a couple of activities we're going to have people up and moving and then we'll also have a couple of table talks but you can do that at home coming back to the work when we started this effort in 1997 we started with the character counts platform with youth the six pillars of character uh, which you may be familiar with very active at one point and still in some of the schools here trustworthiness respect responsibility fairness caring and citizenship and we started in 1997 
There was one fifth grade classroom in Iowa using the six pillars and character counts. We mobilized a statewide initiative over the first 10 years, trained over 50,000 educators, community leaders in embracing and working on good character development. And in 2019, fast forward, we attained the global rights to character counts, and we now serve 8 million youth worldwide with the character counts framework. And when you look at the six pillars as it relates to character development leading to civility, um, I had the privilege and honor also of serving 14 years in the legislature, and every day I walked up the Capitol, I thought about the six pillars of character as a guidepost, because they're about decision-making. Governor Ray talked about it's a way of life. It's not just words on a wall. You can't put them up on a wall and expect attitude and behavior to change. Um, it's about how you operate. So when I talk about the six pillars of character, I talk about I and action. What can I, Scott Racker, do today to act in a capacity worthy of trust? What can I do to treat people with respect, regardless of how they may have treated me or whom they are or what they've done? Can I be responsible and accountable for the choices I make and the consequences that come from those choices? Can I demonstrate fairness in my decisions as it impacts others, demonstrate a caring heart? Can I demonstrate good citizenship? So they're I. We're not the character police, nor are you the character police. But it sets that foundation of work. Now, we work from early childhood to the corporate community and public service arena. Uh, one of the things as it relates to civil liberty I'm really excited about is that we're working with state legislative leaders in all 50 states, U.S. territories, Canada, and Mexico on how they can work better together. I was just five weeks ago in Alaska working with their House Majority Caucus, and they're the only caucuses in the country in Alaska that are not partisan. They've coalesced outside of the politics around issues. Uh, the 21 of the 40 uh, is the majority caucus, 16 Republicans, or 16 Democrats, three Republicans, and two independents. But the Republicans are the largest number of people elected in the House. But the caucus coalesced around this. And we're going to do a case study on it because you can learn from this. And what you can learn is how people can disagree without being disagreeable. And uh, I want to give you a little context on civility. I begin with the end in mind. Before you leave tonight, we'll have some conversation about what does it take to create a culture of civility, and it's this connection, culture shaping, using the right words and respect, self-awareness, and accountability. And if you and those you work with do these things right and well, you will have a heightened level of civility in addressing really tough questions. I see the mayor taking a picture of the PowerPoint. That's great. You'll also have this. All of the slides will be available. We'll send out. Deb's actually already got the PowerPoint to send out. So what I like to do when I have any session is, because we're going to have some interactivity, uh, I do what we call a compact for excellence. It's a very simple question for us tonight. We're scheduled to be here till 8.30. We'll see how long it takes. But for us to do our best work and treat each other with care and respect tonight, what will it take? Now, these are the things I know as a presenter. I need to have you participate. Um, be present. Your feet are here. It's the end of a long day. There's a lot going on. Might have emergencies, kids stuff, family stuff, all of those things, but to be present. And when you're in conversation, don't hide and don't dominate. Like if I sit at your table, I will talk all the time. And I should be the one asking some others, well, what do you think about that? Okay. So don't hide, don't dominate. Listen actively. Um, when I talk about listening actively, uh, listen for response after you've listened to understand. What we tend to do is listen for response. I, I, look, I look at it this way. Somebody's got three paragraphs they're saying to me, and in the second sentence, my brain is already processing what I'm going to say back to them. I'm formulating my thoughts. And then they've gone on, and I've really missed the real context of what they were saying. So listen to understand, and then listen to be, uh, respond. Seek to understand and be understood. We'll talk a little bit about that. Respect each other in the process. This won't be hard, especially in this size dynamic. Um, we're not going to have a break tonight, but we'll start and end on time. We're not going to run you till 9 o'clock. That's not going to happen here. Respect each other. Essential IT use. A lot of people take notes on their phones, and that that's great. But, you know, checking what the line is on the baseball game tomorrow night or football or whatever it is, I guess. Basketball is tomorrow night. Uh, not the right time. Be open to new ideas. Uh, so it's like, why are we talking about civility with mental health? Uh, those seem almost like both important things, but are they even linked or aligned? It's like how I think having conversations in a community-wide basis about what do we do about mental health, those are not easy conversations to have. Those can be difficult conversations. So it takes a level of civility, connection, communication, awareness, and to be candid. Be candid in your conversations. That's how we grow and learn. So that's what I know. And what I would just ask you, is there anything else you would like to see on that compact with your level of participation tonight?
You're good with those? Thumbs up? Okay, by asking you thumbs up, then I'm in agreement with you. So we, like if we're doing a, we're working on a food insecurity process in the metro region. And every person that's come to the table has passion and vision to feed our hungry neighbor. But interestingly enough, some can't always get along. So we actually did this process. We spent 20 minutes on it, just on how we were going to work together. And it's been a guideline. I call these ground rules for engagement. And anytime you're using a meeting format, this is something I'm going to come back to and talk to you about. So context. I want to give you a little context about civility before I get you talking to each other. So people are like, oh, Scott, you know, we're all so nice in Iowa. It's just Iowa nice all the time, and we don't need this civility stuff. It's, it's you know, why, why do we need it? And this is why I will tell you that we need civility. Um, incivility, which we see, is impacting our communities. It's impacting governance in our communities. Um, it disrupts the nature of how we come together to try and solve difficult, challenging problems. Um, the public is losing confidence in now even more local elected officials. Used to be, I don't like Congress, but I love my congressperson. Now we can't get anything done federally. Now it's going down in, at the state house, right? Now it's like, so what's happening in our community? And there's just this almost virtual negativity that comes around. And, and that's why people are in public service, to solve difficult issues and challenges. But I think these are some of the contexts. One of the things we talk about is that civility does deal with really basic things of niceness, kindness, respect, decency, decorum. I mean, Governor Ray lived that, even in challenging issues. If you knew him, he was that type of persona. But the civility that we're talking about is much, much deeper than that. This is not just, oh, well, let's just gloss over and be friendly and kind to each other. We're trying to get to a point of how do we disagree without being disagreeable? How do we have the really hard conversations? How do we take um, individuals, organizations that are diametrically opposed and bring them together in a way that we can talk about what's better for the greater good? And that's the level of civility we're trying to get after. This is a great definition. People ask us, well, how do you define it? Because civility is a lot like respect. What does respect look like? Well, in some countries, it looks like you take off your shoes before you go in the house. And in other places, it looks like you keep your shoes on the whole time. We define things culturally and where we are. But this is a de definition I really like about civility, and especially what talks about civility is the hard work of staying present, even with those with whom we have deep rooted and fierce disagreements. It's political in the sense that it's necessary prerequisite for civic action, but it is political too in the sense that it's about negotiating interpersonal power so that everyone's voice is heard and nobody's ignored. Doesn't mean that everybody's gonna like the outcome, but people are heard, they're not ignored, their issues have been brought to the table. Now, translate that into mental health. People want to be heard. They want to be understood. So I have two, uh, two great nieces that have autism. I was familiar with autism, but let me tell you, I've got a much deeper understanding of that when it's personal. And just a heightened awareness about what happens around them, right? So when you have these experiences, those are hard things. Those get my context up around civility. I want to give you some data because you're a bright community up here, data-informed decisions. This is what the data says about civility. Weber Shandwick has been surveying. You can see the statistics there. 69% believe that civility is a major problem. 75% um, think it's in crisis in certain areas. Um, the depth of polarization, um, people are abusing people of the opposing party, not just the party in negative light, but the people. And the challenge we've seen, and I, I have not, I will grant you, I have not followed any of your local elections here to know if you've seen this partisan increase into school board and city council elections. But that, that's a challenge because there's a difference between partisan and nonpartisan and it affects governance. And that goes to a whole other issue that we can talk about, which is civic literacy uh, that we need to continue to work on. So this poll that they've done with Weber Shandwick, they've done for over a decade. And the interesting thing is there's really not been a whole lot of movement. Uh, when they dial into real specific areas like the advent of social media and things of that nature, there were some spikes with this, but this is a trend. We're trending in the wrong way. This is just within two months ago, 85% of Americans believe society is less civil than it was a decade ago. But here's the kicker to that. They asked a qualifying question, why? And this one surprised me because it said media and public officials. 
media and public officials. When in fact, as I observe things, I tend to think it's more the public than public officials. That we see it manifested in campaigns, certainly, but I, I think there's an inversion there I'd like to dig deeper. This one was interesting. This is the Pew. They've done this over uh, multiple years. This one is very surprising in the statistical results over a four-year period here. And the, the analysis goes back to both Republicans and Democrats are saying about members of the other party, they're more immoral, dishonest, close-minded than other Americans. And look at the number that say four or more of those traits are true if they belong to that party is what they're saying. So that's a context of what's even our mindset of we see somebody's yard sign in their yard, we're making judgments about them to the point of saying they're immoral and dishonest. And now we're going to try and resolve what the fence line's going to be between our two houses. But at the same time, you know, when the tornadoes or the floods come, you don't ask what yard sign you've got in your basement before we help our neighbor, right? So if we can do that in crisis, I don't know why you can't do it regularly. These are just some of the same statistics there that show the very unfavorable ratings. That one tells you the trend is going in the wrong direction. And people tell us this, it's never been worse. And they're wrong. They are wrong. And I just want you to keep that in mind. And this is why it brings me hope and optimism. This is why they're wrong. We live in a country where a sitting vice president challenged a former cabinet member to a duel over a political argument. He'd shamed him and shot and killed him on a Jersey shore. And I have to believe there were people at that time, there are people like you today that said, civility, mental health, I want to go hear more about it. What can we do to be better? Can you think about what our world would look like today if a sitting vice president was shooting and killing somebody, right? We've gotten better than that. Our 1856, Sumners uh, and Brooks, the cane is in the Smithsonian. There was an anti-slavery speech given in the Senate. The House member was so incensed, took the cane and bludgeoned the senator almost to death on the Senate floor. Think about that. And interestingly enough, both individuals were resoundingly reelected in the next election cycle. Both of them were considered heroes in their district. That's precursor, obviously, to the Civil War. Height of incivility, of violence, of not being able to resolve a decades-old issue, right? And when we talk about campaigning, and I don't have the answers on campaigning, but we need to talk about it. Um, this is not a recent manifestation. Read those words from 1800 presidential can con conversation and campaign literature, and imagine what that looks like in today's language on Twitter or on Instagram. So when people say it's never been worse than it is today, that's just not true. And in fact, it's not even the question we should ask. We should ask the question you're asking here in Ames, which is, what can we do to be better? How can you equip us with tools and strategies to be better, to have hard conversations and dialogue? So those are the things that bring me hope and optimism. And I am hopeful and I am very optimistic. And, and I tell you, we were talking earlier, it's like Governor Ray and I talk a lot about presentation. It's like, we never look at the people that aren't in the room. We look at the people that are in the room. Like, I'd love to have 50 people here. You'd all love that. But we don't know how many are online. We also don't know that each of you can take this and equip other people. So the hope and optimism is we're here in Ames, Iowa tonight talking about civility as it relates to hard topics, specifically to mental health. What can we take away from that? And that's my challenge is to bring to you some things that I hope can be strategies and tools when you walk out of here of the whatever time you've invested with me and I with you, that you would walk out with one or two things to do better or differently in your own life as it relates specifically to mental health, but any area. And if I haven't done that, then you should not invite me back again because that's what this is about. So the first thing I wanna bring it to you is connection. Connection, it's the foundation, I believe, not only of leadership, but of civility. It's the foundation of communitas, how we integrate and interact in our community. So I'm going to get you up, see, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, okay, you got 12 here, all right. So what I'd like you to do is stand and partner you're a small group and you're a close community, so you, a lot of you know each other. But try and find somebody you don't know like really well. Like if you're golfing with somebody three times a week, don't go to that person. If it's somebody you see out in the street and say hello to, go to that person. So one-on-one, -on -one, and then you're going to visit with each other, going back and forth on three questions I'm going to give you. And when you're uh, finished, move back to your table place, or I will call time because I don't want to keep you too long. So if you could stand up and find a person. And I do want you to stand. There's a purpose for this. I need to have you stand and stay standing if you can. Find a person. Has everybody partnered up with a person? 
All right, there we go. Okay, so here's your three questions. What do you enjoy most about Ames? What do you do for fun? And when, if ever, have you seen civility demonstrated at a high level in a difficult conversation? And sub question to that is what were the habits you saw that make that stand out as a civil conversation? So I'm gonna give you about five minutes to talk to each other around those three questions. All right, now I'll come back and bring you back. Two of you can take a hand out. What they're doing right now is what they're doing right now. We we'll have to turn this off and just. If you're not already at the third question, you should move to that one. So I love the field. And, and so a lot of law enforcement encounters, people just need to be heard. And so I love that story. I hope I never I sometimes I see this American department raising up campus, like So I think sometimes we just keep up waiting. Sometimes it seems like the person, the leader, the person of power, has already decided for them. So they're really instead of having a choice, I'll give you two more minutes. Two more minutes. So, 
Sometimes then it, why for me, I kind of check it out, right? I think people don't. I like how the way it's more talked about tonight. Yeah. And I like the idea yeah. that you're yeah. going to make a decision to her who's bad, respecting the person who's not getting it. Wow. So, for me, I think you say it that they're doing it. Um, I think it's in a sense, I think part of the college actually, uh, but now it's just one. Give you one more minute. It's very uh, austere and yeah. All right, you can wrap up the current comments you're on and head back to your table place. You can go back to your place or you can stay there. Oh, no, no you got to go back. That's another place. All right, so thank you, one, praise and polish on the compact for actively participating. It is awkward. Very rarely happens when somebody says, yeah, I'm not going to stand up and talk to somebody. Right, that can happen. So this is an icebreaker with a purpose in my mind. And I think they're important. I've learned more and more about them. Um, one thing, a little transparency in the facilitation and process here. Getting people to stand up when you're in a meeting of any length is important. And especially when they're in hard chairs. The body, the physiology of the body operates differently. And if you stay stationary in the same way, different blood flow to your brain and just having you stand up for a brief period of time and talk to each other has an impact on your cognition. So just a takeaway from that. Um, the other thing that I, I wanna point out, how, how many of you learned something new about the person you talked to? Okay, very good. Now in learning things, were there any of you that found a connecting point, something in similarity? What I like to bicycle for fun. And we did, did anybody have connecting points? What'd you have? Exercise. Okay. Exercise with Dan. He, he likes to bike, and I, I go to Orange Theory. Okay. Awesome. What did you have? Um, we just were talking about um, something um, with the school district that we both agree on. Okay. So my point is this, just off of those two examples. Within five minutes, you learn something new about somebody, and in some cases, you found a connecting point. We've got a large room, and we do this. We've actually got a list of questions we ask, and you're like you know, favorite musical artist and two people out of 200 that talk to each other, it's Beethoven, and they're the only two Beethovens in the entire room, right? And I'm not suggesting that the fact that you exercise or have similarity on school issues gonna resolve your ability to have a difficult conversation about mental health, but it's not gonna hurt. It's not gonna hurt to have connectivity and relationships. And even if it's, we can agree on, this is the best steakhouse in town, you've got something that you agree on, that you've found a common bond and a link amongst each other. The other thing with Icebreaker with the purpose of this is I did want you to talk a little bit about civility. It has been a long day for all of us, I'm sure. And you're here and now it's like, okay, what's this gonna be about? And still have that thought, did I get that done? Do I have to get that email out yet tonight? Gonna to get to have time to mow the yard, whatever it might be. I wanted you to talk about civility. Now I'm not gonna process that out in this case, but I want you to at least have that in your mind. So your brain's thinking about that. Now, I will tell you, uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples. 14 years I served in the Iowa legislature. I sat in caucus meetings, sometimes for as long as four to six hours, not one time in 14 years did we stand up and talk to each other and find out who we are, what we knew about each other. It was always about business, 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 business. Think about the number of community meetings you're in. In fact, I don't know what they've done in the other conversations that you've had here with the presenter, but you could have taken 
and said to the presenter, by the way, we're going to start at 6.30 to 8.30 is the time, but you're not on until 6.40 because you can do an icebreaker for 10 minutes if you want. If not, we're going to do something because we want our people to stand up and talk to each other. So where are you intentional about building relationship with others? And, you know, it could be a van ride someplace. Uh, I wish when I was younger, like your age, people were talking to me about this. The intentionality of building relationships. And candidly, does not happen here. Does not happen here. And so just the challenge of being intentional about building relationships is foundational. If you want to have hard conversations about mental health, it's good to have with relationships with people. Now, we talk about surface to substance, right? What do you do for fun? And have you been involved in a civility engagement where you saw good practice? Surface, what's your favorite restaurant to? What's, what's a competency of character in your life that you think is, you're strong in? Or what's in a, a person you look up to or a character quality that you would like to continue to grow in your leadership? Those are substantive, right? Like when do you talk to people about are they a patient person or not until you need to assign someone the task and you really need somebody that's very patient for that task? Right. So my point is surface to substance and to have the courage and curiosity to meet people who are new and different, because there's a we were talking about books at the library. Another one for you to put down on the civility platform. And I wouldn't be surprised if you have it here uh, is Bill Bishop wrote a book called The Big Sort. And this book is about how to do how do we get to where we are today, which is basically a, a lot of different contexts. One of them is that we move from our front porches in our neighborhood to our back porches with privacy fence, and that we moved into neighborhoods of like-minded people, and we gather with like-minded people, that we don't find that balance of difference. We were talking earlier about shared experience at Grinnell College and the, the, the vast diversity of students that I went to Grinnell with. I learned so much in the dining hall from people that had different world experiences that I did just being open to people that were different and new. And when you don't have those experiences, that doesn't happen. I'm gonna show you a video about two people that are vastly different because the question is, well, that sounds good, but how would you go about trying to connect with someone that is different or even new to you? And I want you to listen to this video and see what comes to your mind because I'm gonna ask you to talk about it after you come out of listening to this video. Well, a friend of mine passed away, and she was all about reconciliation, always about reaching out to people and to unlikely people. When she passed away, I wanted to do something to honor her. And I thought, who would be the most unlikely person on the planet that I would reach out to? And it was Bob. I'm the president and CEO of the Family Leader. And our mission statement is to strengthen families by inspiring Christ-like leadership in the home, the church, and government. I'm the executive director at One Iowa, which is the state's largest lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender organization. Uh, I've been an activist and an advocate and sometimes an agitator in this movement for almost 30 years. What well, Donna and I, we see the world very differently. Uh, in our view on marriage, on sexuality, and probably on a host of a lot of other issues. I guess you'd have to say that my impression of Bob was not only he was the opposition, he was the enemy. Uh, I've probably made statements about her and her organization in the press. She's probably made statements about me and my organization in the press. We, we weren't natural allies. We weren't natural coffee buddies. And so she emailed the family leader and said, hey, I talked to Bob. And Bob said he'd be willing to do coffee. Let me know a good time of day. And so they shared that email with me like, uh, is this true? I mean, is this real? And I said, yeah, it's real, but I never thought she'd follow up on it. <laughs> I never thought that he would respond. And so we set a date uh, to have coffee. And that was the beginning of this amazing journey. I remember walking in just, just being very nervous. I had no idea what to expect, none at all. Yeah, you know, the skeptic in me thought she would have an agenda and she probably thought I might have an agenda. But as soon as we sat down, I thought she doesn't have an agenda. She just wants to get to know who I am. And that really compelled me to say, I should want to get to know who she is. I think when people have the courage to show you who they are, uh, something happens. And so what surprised me about Bob was his humanity. Uh, he's an incredible dad. 
I also found him to be really funny and I didn't expect that at all. But we laugh, we laugh a lot. Uh, Donna's a very good person. She's a passionate person. Uh, she has advocated for her issues tirelessly uh, for over three decades. So regardless if I agree or disagree with her on the issues, I have a tremendous respect for her. For a long time, I've been really tired of the hate and the aggression and the kind of snarkiness. We can disagree without being disagreeable. We can fight the good fight in the court of public opinion, but we don't have to hurt each other. That's, I think, the big takeaway for me. We don't have to hurt each other, because when we do that, we're hurting ourselves. We get coffee about once every couple of months. And I think with Donna, her and I readily assessed uh, that we have a lot of common interest. Uh, we have some common ground. The only regret in all of that is that I wasn't the one to ask her out for coffee. Uh, and she's the one who asked me out. And I'm glad she did, but I kind of feel like I should have. What surprised me was not that he liked me. I thought, yeah, he'd like me. What surprised me was I really liked him. It hasn't changed my beliefs. Uh, it, may have, it may have changed my approach because when we do put out a press release, when we do make a public statement, uh, many times I think, I wonder how Donna will view this. Here's the deal. If Bob and I can have coffee, if we can tell stories and laugh and get to know each other, if we can like each other, then I think almost anyone can find that person in their life and maybe they can reach out their hand and invite them in. You're about three minutes at your table right now. Just talk about any insights you had from listening to that video. Any insights that gives you around civil conversations. Then we'll come back and process. I'll give you about three minutes for that. But it seems like from the video, when you step over the line to disagreeable, your tone has changed and you're becoming uh, more insulting and you're attacking you know, someone as the meaner person um, rather than just sticking to what you share.
I'll bring you back together. So I'll bring it back together. What are some of the things you're talking about at the table? What were impressions or insights from that video that you were talking about? Just get a couple up here and see what you're talking about. I'm sorry, we were talking about your question. <laughs> what, what were you talking about? Insights from the video. What in, what what struck you about that video? Uh, well, we were we were just talking about how the, she was. They, they went. They met on neutral ground, so it wasn't come to my office or your office. And then the other comment that we talked about was his comment about I now think differently about how I put something out. I'm not changing who I am or what I'm believing, but thinking about what would she think about that. Just curious if she thinks that when she put, when she would have put something out, and she did. Um, okay. And uh, I want to come back to the neutral ground. I think that's a really important element. The other really important element about that area of them even first connecting was first the offer was made. Neither one of them thought the other would follow up. So just even the follow through of connecting. I mean, how many times do you see some? Oh, we need to get together, and then. Uh, you know, you see him again three months later, it's like, yeah, I think that was on me, but I didn't do that, right? But we'll do that. So the follow-up, right, the ask and the follow-up's important. But they came without agenda, other than the agenda to get to know the person. And that that's a real foundational key there, and it's very hard to do because we set up in our minds who people are based on what they've said, they've done, what organizations they belong to, all this, but they came together just to find out who each other were. So I think that's a really important point. What other things were you talking about? I think it's significant that they did this over coffee or a meal. Um, I, at some point tonight, maybe we'll talk about the role of social media, Facebook, and uh, you can't do this over chat on the internet. You, there's this concept of a shared meal and the possibilities of uh, connecting on a very human level that way. And so uh, I don't think it was irrelevant that they did this over a coffee. Good point. Anything else in your minds? In your packet, I put a couple of the other things that, that tend to follow up that I've, we've mentioned a couple of those here. Um, they did find common ground with each other. They focused on that, whether it was a sense of humor, family person, those types of things. They did find a way to disagree about things without being disagreeable. I'll give you a couple other follow-ups on this relationship. So Donna uh, contracted cancer and she has since passed away. And she and her wife asked Bob to give a eulogy at her celebration of life service, which is also out on YouTube. I can send the link to Deb if you wanna send it out. Um, and talked specifically about civility uh, and how they did disagree, but that comment that that Donna made about you can have your opponents don't need to be your enemy, right? That you vilify them. And before she passed, I had an opportunity to visit with, with both of them. They've been on Drake campus and had talked, this, this gathered national attention. I mean, they, they were as far apart on issues as most people could imagine, but formed this friendship around that. And a point Donna made to me one day, I thought was just really fascinating. It's like, if I had been trying to change Bob's mind, there would be no way I could change that if I didn't communicate with him, if I didn't have relationship, if I didn't connect with him. And in my life, I don't know anybody I've ever changed their mind without having a relationship with them. And that struck me. That was like, oh, you know, there's, right? New information comes in. I've read a new data report. I believe that, but tends to be a relationship-based engagement. So there's a lot to unpack with that, but the challenge is whom, whom would you be, right, for you? Who would be a least likely person in Ames? 
who would be an unlikely person. Maybe even think of it within mental health, right? You've been coming to these, you're part of these around mental health. Is there somebody that you're like, how come they don't get it, right? And or it might be somebody that's sitting on the other side of the little league field that last year they were on your team and this year they're on the other team and you don't like the way they're cheering against your kid, whatever it might be. Who would be that least likely person? And it doesn't need to be as far an extreme as Bob and Donna, but if you're concerned about civility, and, and again, take it into the mental health arena, who would that be? Would you be willing to reach out to them and ask them to connect just to get to know them? Breaking down barriers and building up community. I love this picture. Uh, this former governor right here in the upper left at the Capitol. He was governor for 14 years. He had a ping pong table in the Capitol. He was a very good ping pong player. It relaxed him. He played with his staff, but most significantly, he played with every legislator every year, at least one time. And they played by two sets of rules. They played by the rules of ping pong. And if you didn't know, he would teach you how to play. And the other rules were you could not talk about anything related to state budget, state policy, executive agencies, individuals in state government. You could talk about vacations, your life experiences, the things that interested you. It was just to build relationships so that when they did need to have hard conversations about tough issues, that they had a relationship around that. I also think and this just comes to me more. I wish I, wish I would have asked him this question directly, but. Um, he graduated in 1946 Roosevelt High School and spent two years in the Army in Japan in post-war reparation time. So people shooting and killing his friends and family member and people he's working with being shot and killed by Americans. And it had an effect on him of the difference between an opponent and an enemy. And in the political sphere and community sphere, he's very cautious to look at people as the enemy. The reason I like this particular picture, it's the only time the ping pong table was brought into the conference room, which now is named in his honor at the Capitol, the Ray Conference Room. And when Nixon opened China, for those of us that are old enough to remember, China was the enemy. We had not had any relations with them for decades. We weren't talking to each other. Nixon went to China. The next plane that went from the U.S. was a delegation of governors and spouses. And Governor and Mrs. Ray invited the Chinese through the State Department to come to Iowa. And when the delegation came to the United States the first time, they went to Washington, D.C. and L.A. And in the middle of that trip, they came to Iowa. And when they came to Iowa, the first thing they did when they got to the Capitol from the airport is rather than going to the formal office for detente and tea and document signing, they came in and played ping pong for two hours and laughed and they built a bond and a relationship. Now, fast forward, that relationship became very solid in Iowa. They continue to come. But during the early years of that, a young legislator who became lieutenant governor and then governor formed a bond with the son of a provincial government official, like a county level official. For over 30 years, they've had this relationship and that young legislator is Ambassador Terry Branstad and the son of the government uh, official is President Xi Jinping of China. So when he was appointed uh, to be ambassador of China, regardless of your politics of whatever the administration, the reality is, would you rather have with things like COVID and fentanyl, somebody that had a 30 year relationship and friendship or somebody that was an enemy and animosity. And if you ever have the opportunity, I bring, bring ambassador governor Brandstead up here to talk about this. It's fascinating because they still have a relationship, but he's very disappointed in how he withheld information from him. And, you know, it's a very dynamic relationship. But the point is it was still better than having no relationship at all. So the reason I bring that to you is who is the most unlikely person for you? This is what we do to challenge people around civility. If, if you want to see things get better, if you're concerned about civility and aims, what will you do about it? Who would be the people you might reach out to? Hey, I went to that session. I'd just like to talk to you, get to know you better. I know we might not agree on things. I don't want to talk about those things. I just want to get to know you better. So that's a challenge. My point is we start foundationally with connection, okay? Then from there, we move into culture shaping. Uh, we love this mantra. We shape the culture, the culture shapes the character. I'll give you my analogy of this. I'm a speed limit driver. I grew up that way. My parents were speed limit drivers. Um, I drove from Des Moines to Ames tonight. And knowing that I was going to even mention this, between Des Moines and Ames, and the traffic was very slow coming through Ankeny, but once we got past, you know, the north end of Ankeny, I was passed by 72 cars, and I passed one truck. I drive the speed limit. My point is, you know this, most people on the interstate highways are driving 
six, seven, eight miles over the speed limit. Now in Urbandale where I live, and I'm sure there's a street like this in Ames, I just don't know which one it is, but in Urbandale, if you get off the interstate and you drive on Aurora Avenue, four lane street, it's 25 miles an hour and people that are familiar with the community drive 25 miles an hour. Same people that were driving eight miles over on the interstate. Why is that? The culture shapes the character. They have the, they're the same people, they're the same character. Here's how the culture shapes it. Culture on the interstate highway, less likely at eight miles an hour over you're gonna get stopped and very unlikely, although not completely, but very unlikely there's gonna be families and kids and dogs walking across the street. Aurora has two elementary schools, middle school, high school, two parks, a lake, and a residential area. There's people walking all the time, and they've got, a, as I said, a high school with high school students that like to drive fast. And they run radar at two places every day, and the Urbandale police will stop you at 26 or 27, over. And that keeps people, right? So culture shapes character. So if you want to create a culture of having hard conversations, how do you create that? character of oh, it's a fulcrum. How do you create inviting spaces for people to sit down with a cup of coffee? Let's break bread together. We know this in Iowa, meals help, right? Let's, let's, let's get together. There's some research out about churches that have fractured and one of the things that they talk about, some of the churches that fractured had stopped having potlucks where people had brought shared meals and that you'd enjoyed something that somebody else had made. That's a whole nother session we'll get to sometime. But my point is this ability to get together and shape culture of what you do happens in very small ways that you might not even be paying attention to. We've done a lot of research on this with some partner organizations in your public service, in the arena. When things are going well around conversations of mental health in this community, these things are happening at a high level. People are collaborating. They're demonstrating respect to each other. They're focused on the topic. They're identifying how, here's one of the things about dealing with mental health and talking about mental health is the stress that it brings to people, A, to even talk about it, or if they're dealing with it personally, the stress in their life is different than it is for somebody that's not dealing with it. Talk to parents of children that have autism and the things they're trying to deal with compared to children that don't in their lives. There's a different level of stress. And if we're not managing these things well, it's hard to get to that collaboration. Civility is one of those in the community side. If we don't have civility as a base to how we talk to each other, we're not going to have optimal performance in the outcomes we have. That's why there's a connectedness to this. This is the challenge we have though. That's great research, that's great data, but this is the world we live in, right? I love this in the public service. Like this is your city council, right? You got the truck and somebody's got the sticks and we got to get them delivered. But then you've got divisiveness, COVID-19, still fallout, mental health challenges, financial uncertainties, racial equity and social. I mean, our, our trucks are full, right? And you might even be some days like the poor cow on the lower right that's about to be crushed by the inability to other get things done well. I love pictures, by the way. I love this analogy. So this, to me, is a leadership issue. There was a task to get the boxes from here to someplace else, and somebody directed somebody to load the boxes for somebody to come in and drive the cart. Because the person that's loading and driving did not do that. But they did their job. I did my job. I loaded all the boxes on the cart. Now it's your issue to get them where you go. What I think about in community is that we're probably pretty good at these things of getting the cart down and the boxes where they need to go. We put those fires out. But how do we stop and ask the question, what do we need to do so that doesn't happen again? Oh, here we've had this situation caused by our inability to identify mental health challenges that people were needing and the services weren't there and we're pointing fingers at others, but we've not had that community conversation about where we could all come together to serve them. How do we avoid that type of situation from happening again? These are hard and deep questions that a community needs to ask itself right now. And to think that it's another layer of governance, you know, because we've got several city council members and mayor here, this is, this is so much bigger than governance. Governance should be about our ability to help those that don't have the ability to help themselves, even at every level. But the reality is these are community-wide issues that we have to be talking about. So I've already given you this, but I wanna give it to you as a strategy. When you're having those conversations, set up ground rules for engagement. What's it gonna take for us to do our best work and trade each other with care and respect? We're gonna have a hard conversation. I don't want you to take what I'm saying personally. I wanna be informed, those types of things. Now, right words and respect are critical in communicating 
on difficult issues. So I'm gonna show one more quick video and I want you to, this is just a quick hitter. Is this good communication or is this poor communication? All right, what do we have there? Good communication or poor communication? Perfect. What, what did they say? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we don't understand their language. What were the things that made you think it was perfect? Because they mimicked each other. They, they definitely were present with each other. It appeared there was some clarity of stating something, whatever the language was. What else? There looked like there might have been some eye contact. Right. right. So we know good communication when we see it. We know when we don't have it. And again, the challenge is a lot of times we point the finger of what somebody else needs to do. And I want you to continue to think about self-reflection of what I can do. We actually, uh, in tough conversations, talk about carefrontation rather than confrontation. Carefrontation is we care about our community so much that we have to have the hard conversation. And in fact, we can't wait until some other time. We have to do it now. I'd really, I'd really rather wait for somebody else to take that leadership role in the community. Hey, maybe United Way will take that on. Maybe the Noon Kiwanis Club, they were down here earlier. Maybe they'll take that on. Who do we know that can take this on, right? But sometimes you just have to get after it. The other thing about this is, is that we have become a society, and I do think the social media brings us, we go after people rather than problems in many regards. We attack people rather than problems. And I'll give you an example. Um, with COVID as an example. We do a whole other session on integrity and integrity in systems, organizations, and processes. Integrity in a process system or organization is built on design, implementation, and use. A system is designed a certain way to be implemented and then used. If you're a Pella Corporation, you're designing a window with a certain factor. It has to be built that way and then installed that way. And if the installer, who's not a Pella, employee installs it wrongly and it leaks, Pella is still the one that you're mad at because your window leaks, right? When we went through COVID, uninsurance, unemployment insurance claim systems in states are built 10 to 15% at max for the systems to process to work. So when there's 75% unemployment insurance claims, states can't process those and people aren't getting checks and they are calling everybody they know and they are mad at people. And the people that many of them they're calling can't do anything about it because it's a system that's not prepared to absorb that. So it's the type of thing you need to look at in your systems even of how do we go after the real problem and not the people. And just that sense of humanity. And we talk a lot about using I statements rather than you statements. I think, I feel, I believe, I don't understand I'm not sure you're correct on that. I'd like to have you check your source rather than you're wrong. You don't ever get it right. You put us in this. Whenever those you's come out, we all get defensive. So think about even the language you use in these conversations. Seek win-win. This is uh, attitudinally, I'm a compromise guy. Uh, I want, you want, we could. I want to see this. We want, our, we want those with mental health needs taken care of in our community, especially those in the cracks and gaps. We still want to have a responsible city budget and a responsible county budget. And we've got to, you know, we can't, I want, you want, we could. Where do those things come together? How do we leverage other support then? And there's always other ways to look at this. And then we have to own our mistakes and next steps. We don't always get things right. I've evolved my thinking on that. So we just go through that. When you communicate with people of this thing, the one thing I want to share about communication, I hope you know all these, like, is this, the, is this a good thing to call somebody out in a group on? Is that going to get their attention? Or is it, that's a better in the hallway afterwards. I'm a little league person. So it's like public praise and private critique. And you watch a little league game of somebody that gets thrown out at second base, a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, and the third base coach yells at them across the field that they did not run fast enough and the coach is mad and yelling, and I've watched this, that does not motivate better behavior. And I'm wondering, what does that coach do in the workplace environment if that's what they're trying? Like, that eight-year-old was running as fast as they could. 
Now, they could have coached him to not look back where the ball was coming. That might have been quicker. But shouting that from the third base is not the time. If they get there safe, yay, great job, Scott. But if it's like, Scott, come into the dugout. Next time you're running from first to second, you just run to second. Don't worry about where the ball is. Don't look three times. But we lose control of ourselves. And you think about it. The significance of a little league game, that we've lost control, that you've got that type of Anger is what it comes out as. They're angry. The coach is angry at them. But the one I want to point out is I spent my lifetime really thinking a lot about what I want to achieve in challenging things and in outcomes. And I think it's equally important to think about what you want to avoid. I want to avoid separating a relationship with this friend over this issue. I want to avoid bringing a fracture into our community because I am inflexible to listen to somebody else. So I've been trying to be more open about not just what I want to achieve, but what do I want to avoid in conversation. So I've talked earlier about seek to understand and be understood. Verify and clarify statements are critically important. What's that point of view? Explain that to me again. The reiteration of that. These are just clear communication skills. I've talked about avoiding you and using the I statements. Conversations, a lot of times people are like, oh, I don't negotiate. And I do, I think conversations and negotiation. I want, you want, we could. Roles, goals, and strategies. How are you going to get after mental health and aims? How are you going to get after really having an impact? You got to identify roles, people and organizations are play, goals, what are we trying to achieve, and what are the strategies we do that? That's part of a negotiation process. And sometimes it's the early efforts that set us up for not getting optimal performance. We put the wrong people on the bus. That shouldn't have been the lead organization. We should have had two working together as the lead. I mean, these are the types of things you need to think through as a community when you're going after difficult issues. Because I like this. I want, you want, we could. That's just a mantra. I don't expect you to pull the slides out. What do you say about negotiation? When you're talking to somebody about what you're trying to achieve, I want, you want, we could. And in doing that, you have to know what your non-negotiables are, right? Well, that's, you know, you want to stay for two more hours here. It's a non-negotiable for me right? Those types of conversations. So communication is related to connectivity, and that's wrapped around culture shaping. Now there comes to us self-awareness. We are very quick to point out the other people that aren't doing things right and well, and a little self-reflection is always healthy. I like this piece, leader, participant, detractor. And the question is, am I, am I being a leader in this where I'm really embracing it and trying to motivate and empower others to come along? Am I a participant? You know, I believe in the cause and I'm here and I'll, I'll do what I need to do. Or am I a detractor? Am I the one that's always trying to tear down somebody's thought, trying to tear it up, trying to, because that does not get us to progress. So it's a little self-reflective tool that you can use at times. So I bring this into you and this is in your packet. And I want to walk through this with you in two ways of a civility plan around mental health. So the first thing when we talk about a civility plan an individual civility plan, is understanding what are the things that are really hot button issues for you. So for tonight, what we're going to do with that is we're going to say a discussion of mental health issues impacting those in our community. So I shared with you earlier, I didn't used to have a hot button issue about anything as it related to mental health until I was in the legislature and I had an encounter with a little league coach who had a son daughter who could not get into a group home because she was on a wait list and he was afraid she was going to die or be in the hospital or prison. And I thought he wanted to talk to me about moving my son from catching to pitching. And he wanted to know how come the state underfunded $1.5 million of the median Medicaid and his daughter could not get into a group home. And so now my attention's gathered, right? And then that $1.5 million grew to $25 million over the next four years, and I'm losing sleep over this. And that caught my attention. And then I've got these two beautiful children in my life, not directly, but within our family, that have autism. And it's like one of the great miracle moments at our daughter's wedding was when one of those girls took the mic and spoke publicly. Because she was told, the family was told, when she was two, she's eight years old now, that she was nonverbal and she would never talk. Think of that hard conversation. I mean, we're talking about these types of issues and their personal issues. What I'm trying to say is they're personal. And sometimes, well, that mental health, that's a, it hasn't touched me. I don't know. But you know what? It does touch our community. It touches all of us, 
And we haven't really grasped that yet as a society, I don't think. So communities that get after it's important. So let's say that what mindset should you have if you're coming into a hard conversation around mental health issues? This is what I put up. I was thinking about this. If I was engaged in a conversation one-on-one or in a group, what would I want to bring of the mindset? What is it I want to achieve and avoid? I'd like to understand more quite candidly, so I should be asking more questions than stating my position in this particular meeting. Am I an educator in this meeting? Let me tell you the story about my son's little league coach and the family, what they went through. I'm going to educate you about how this has impacted our lives. Or am I a learner in this meeting? I need to absorb and understand what you're talking about because I don't understand why you're focused on those issues when I've got these needs. I mean, again, it's like there's so many critical needs in our communities. Mental health has so many entrails, um, food, security, insecurity has so much impact, right? And these aren't like isolated silos. That they're, they're complex issues that we deal with. So am I learning or am I an educator? I think a mindset for me is I don't have all the answers and all the knowledge. That's a really good mindset to come into a hard conversation. And if it comes to action and outcomes, if I'm not going to be involved, who is it in our community that is? How do we engage and step up that civic engagement, that civic ownership of the greater good for all, not just what's happening in my yard, right? Behind my fence. And then actions. What should I maintain what should I do to maintain civility? Well, I should listen first and I should ask questions. Those are two things I would say when you get into hard conversations on this, listen and ask questions. Because sometimes somebody will say something and then it's like, and I am this way. You'll say like, we just had this. You asked me one simple question. I talked to you for seven minutes over there when you came in. And that was fine. I go, tell me how you're doing, right? And I've got to do a better job of asking and listening. And then form connections and common grounds. And then outcome and reflection. I call it the drive home test. So this, I'd ask you this, just tonight, drive home from this tonight and say, you know, I spent an hour and 45 minutes, whatever it is. What can I take away from that that I can do better or differently in my life to impact our community? Ask yourself that question. And I hope you can have an answer. Oh, maybe it's just one little thing he said. Maybe it's like, I want to explore that further. So I'm going to give him a call. Maybe these people want to come in and get engaged too. See, just invite people in. Come in, come in, come in, come in. So... What I'm telling you, this is in your packet. If you're really challenged with talking about a particular issue, you can map this out and ask yourself a question, these questions. That's a self-awareness piece. And if you get good at it, you don't need to pull the paper out. It's like, oh, I'm in a difficult conversation. What mindset should I bring to this? What's the action I'm trying to get? And did I do what I wanted to do? So I'm gonna bring in this strategy too. I love this tool and strategy. If there is only one thing you take away, I hope it's something related to this. If you want to change any attitude, behavior, or performance, individually or collectively, in a small group, to a full community, it takes four things, research says, four things operating in concert together. You have to know the clarity of communication. What is it we're going after? What are the habits you want to see done better or differently? Why are those important, the mindset, and what's the accountability? I'll give you an example of this. So does anybody have one of these Fitbit trackers? that counts your steps. Anybody, you got one? Okay, I do too. My mother bought me mine before she passed away, my first one, because she told me, Scott, you need to exercise more. And my wife tells me that, and my doctor tells me that. And every time they tell me that, my response is, yeah, I got that. That's good. And I come out of the doctor's office, and I sit in the car, and I think, I wonder what she really meant by that. Like, should I be running marathons or riding my bike more or going to the gym? I mean, what does that really mean? And my mom bought me the Fitbit. And the Fitbit I like as an example because exercise more means habits. What habits would I do differently than I'm doing now? And the habits relate to the clarity, and that's what the Fitbit gives us. It's pre, you can change it, but it's predetermined 10,000 steps is exercise. Who knew, except it did come out of the Mayo Clinic in the physical therapy department with me, people. So 10,000 steps. So the clarity of communication is what do we want? What's, I think of this as the bumper sticker of why we want to perform better, all right? 10,000 steps. Because I can relate to that, I can, I can do that. So what are the habits for me to get 10,000 steps? I need to park farther away and take the stairs. So when I was, at, I was at the Capitol 14 years, I took the elevator twice. I fervently take this. My wife 
she's into this now too, because like we go to my high V and I'm parking like in Minnesota and walking in rather than waiting for that close parking spot. That And for me, it's a consideration. Other people need that. I can still walk that far. Let's get some steps. I parked the farthest away in my parking lot at work. We went to lunch today with the team. And it's like, who wants to ride with Scott? Not me. He's parked way over on the far end and it's hot. My point is I need to identify what habits get me to exercise more. Why? What's the mindset? So the right reason I put opportunity, I look for opportunities for steps. That's also a habit. So there's not silos here. They kind of work together. But the reason, the mindset for me of why do I want to exercise, I want to be healthy. And I say that because gene pool wise, so I'm 61. I am the third oldest living racker male since the 1500s in our genealogy. My dad was 73 when he passed away. My brother's two years older. And then there's me and everybody else was gone by 56. So exercise now becomes, oh, I, you know, I've got a daughter that's gotten married. I'd love to hold a grandchild someday. I'd love to travel with my wife. I mean, all of these things, that's a motivation for what do we want to do. So, and again, I don't mean to pull Band-Aids off of things here. I don't know a lot about, I did not do a deep dive in Ames before I came up here. But I look back in the last several years to some of the situations we had that did draw state and national attention and the young golfer on the golf course, right? I know one thing in this community, you don't ever want that to happen again, right? What do we do better or differently? And what are the hard conversations we would need to have around that? And I don't know if that's something that inspired some of this or not, but my point is these are not just like rainbow and fluffy cloud kind of things that we're going after here. What's the why that we need to have the hard conversation? because we wanna avoid tragic situations. Now, that one might not have been avoidable. I don't know enough about it. All I'm saying is that type of thing captures a community's attention. And how do you use that for good? And the last piece is accountability. And so that's good for me because like right now, I'm at 6,588. So I've got some work to do if I'm gonna get to 10,000 tonight. So that's my own accountability. And as a leader, you need to have self-accountability. But I also tell you, if you've got a goal and you state what you want, like if there's a group coming together after these sessions, I don't know where the, I mean, this has got, I hope, I hope this has got to be more than just, hey, we had some good sessions and we learned some more. Well, what did we learn and how do we want to put it into action to do something different? What's the headline look like if three years from now, the national news story is what happened in Ames, Iowa? You want to go where a place where mental health is revered and where they get after the challenges. Look what Ames has done over the last three years, right? What's that vision look like? Once you state that publicly, if that's where you want to go, there's a greater accountability. And that I would come back to my mother. My daughter set my mother up and I as Fitbit friends on our phone. Before she passed, I would call her every night, driving home from work, on my hands free, driving home. I'm not a texter and driver. And she would look at her phone and say, oh, I see you've only had 3,000 steps. It must have been a heavy office day. Will you be walking with Martha tonight? My point is when you share a goal or a vision that you will get to something that you want to get to. So now we're going to do this from civility, but that's to, what does that mean? I want to bring it back to this. How do we engage in difficult or challenging conversations around mental health? So you asked me to come talk about civility and mental health. In order to get better, it takes habits, mindset, accountability, and clarity. So we're coming to this, and I'm asking you, what would you think in your community in order to engage in difficult and challenging conversations around mental health, what would be one, two, or three habits that you could do better? And if you want to speak personally or collectively, but I am asking you for, I don't have this one free, filled in. I don't know the community that well. What would it take for you to have challenging conversations? What habits would you need? One habit that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to populate one that you brought up because you said you hope it would come up again. We shouldn't have the discussion over social media. A habit would be a difficult conversation around mental health needs to have people in the same room. That might be a habit. I don't know if that's a habit here that you would need, but it can't be done offline. That might be one. I think one of them was just the... Uh... 
just trying to raise awareness that it exists in Lake Wobegon, also known as Ames. Okay, so one habit that we need to do is we need to raise the awareness that there's an issue here. That's a great habit. Somebody should write this down on your, you got this blank page, you should write this down. You need, and the attitude and behavior might be that we need to work better to hit our mental health issues. So that's a good one. I love that. Raising awareness, habit, what else? They're drinking from a fire hose. So, if we could engage the school districts in a way that the community can help with civility among students. Okay. Bullying issues and those kinds of things. I don't know how to say it. Well, so the way I'm listening to that is maybe some intentional collaboration with the city, the schools. I'll throw in the chamber because I know you've got active folks up here too. Um, what if we're all rolling this, you know, I'm, I'm not a big PJ Fleck fan, but what if we're all rolling the boat the same way? What if we're, what if we're being aware of this? And I'll give you an example, by the way, if you want to look, and I know the mayor's familiar, probably some of the council members, we've done some work in Bondurant. And in the communities we've worked in, I, they're smaller, I get it, but they're growing and have challenges too. But their school board, city council, and chamber, they communicate well and work well together on big, big, the big issues that they're all being impacted with. So that, I, I like this habit. A habit might be an intentional um, discernment with school board, city council, and chamber of how could we be working better together around these issues. That could be a starting point habit. Yes. So, to, to that point, um, I guess I'll just say, I, I'm the mental health advocate for the Ames Police Department. And I do think that we have created awareness in this community um, but to that point, I would love to see what you just said happen, where you have the school district, um, the school board, the police department, and I can name a whole bunch of organizations to have a very raw and authentic, respectful conversation of, if you talked about the bullying, you know, why is that happening? How can we work together, right, and not... Point they need. I, I would love to see that happen. So get them in the same room, and it, when that happens, I mean, if that's one of the things that can evolve out of this, because the challenge is, what are you going to do about it? Maybe you're the catalyst to motivating other people. That might be your next great calling in your role. Might be, might not. But what I want to say is, when you get them all in the same room, you have to start with the big picture, which I'm going to come to in a minute with the mindset. What do we want to achieve, and what do we want to avoid in our community? Because if we can work better together, these things could happen. So I really encourage you. I mean, you're inspiring me. It's like, think how awesome that would be. And it's so much deeper even than mental health. But, but what if there was ongoing communication and connectivity at that type of level? Once a quarter, we've got everybody sitting in the same room. And now we've been doing it for six years. And now it's just a touch base and an update. And it's just part of our habits of what we do. And... We didn't realize we had a resource here that could have helped the schools there. The schools had something they could have helped us here. How do we communicate with our public safety officials? All of those things. You inspired me. I think that's a great habit. That's, and this is what I'm talking about. When you feel that that's a habit. Now, there's the one-off of we get them all in the same room. But how do you keep that going? The ongoing communication. So you've got three right there. Now, you do realize that if you came out of this room... and only did those three things, I think you would move the needle. You can do assessment on that. There's all kinds of community assessment on mental health and that. You've got your own gut reaction. and all. But just think if you did those three things. And that's one thing I want to challenge you to think about when you use this strategy. You don't need 20 habits. Because there's a lot of other things. You've got a lot of sticks on the truck, right? You don't need 20 habits. What's two or three things you might be able to do better or differently in the next three months? six months. What's the time frame of that? When I look at the accountability piece of it too, and I can, I'll say this for myself, that I think we all need to take a pretty deep dive into um, our own reactions, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I think a lot, I, I guess I shouldn't say that. I, I, I think conversations I've had with people, right? I do feel, um, I don't want to be attacked, right? None of us want to be attacked. Um, so how, how can we be part of that solution, right? How can we um, 
have a more um, engaging conversation that brings us together instead of tears us apart, right? And I will say there certainly have been topics that I have this knee-jerk reaction, right, or this defend, because at the end of the day, right, I'm like, that just hurt my feelings, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think sometimes, too, just naming that, like, I think we need to, to maybe say, you know, when I, I had this reaction because it was really hurtful, right? I'm sorry, right? And be, um, you know, holding ourselves accountable, I guess. And in order to have that level of candor with people, you have to have trust. Candor in relationships of trust. Correct. That it's not going to be used against you or against an organization or something. The point is here, hard conversations, you have to start with what are the habits we do better or differently. What you've just described are some phenomenal mindsets that you could bring to that table, as well as accountability. I'll come back to the accountability. So I want to, I want to shift. So now we got three habits. Why? What's the mindset? Why should AIMS even have hard conversations about mental health issues? Yes. I have one more piece of this. Yeah. And I'm not sure how to articulate this. So I agree with everything that's been said with respect to the, the need for greater level of collaboration. Right. But there are limits to what government can do. I agree. And, uh, there are so many people in this community that have a loved one going through a mental health crisis, and they feel like they're the only people in the universe. Mm -hmm. They feel alone. They feel isolated. They don't have a community around them. And I am terrified. So there's only there's only one Julie. Right. We can't we can't clone them as much as we would like to. Mm -hmm. We have to find a way as a community to increase our level of connection, to walk with our neighbors, to walk with our friends. It's it's a stigma. And if you have a kid who's suicidal, I mean, there's nothing more important in your world than that. And and I've watched yeah. people go through this, and it's terrifying. I don't know how to put that in a nice. No, you, you, and it's not nice. And, and I will share. I mean, if any of us have worked with parents that have and are dealing with that, that's not, there's no optimal performance at work with that because that's not what they're, they're not thinking about getting that report to you in time. They're wondering what's happened at three o'clock after school with their son or daughter. I mean, it, it, it that is a reality of the world. And I agree. And so if my language has been more organizationally on that, but I would say in a community conversation, where are the faith communities? within this? Where are other support networks that can be rallied and leveraged to have bigger picture engagement would be a question I'd be asking. Sorry, you had a no, comment. I'm gonna, it's yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. I wanted to go off of that a little because um, at my school, me and my friend created a mental health organization called Moving Forward. And really what we did for the students is just normalizing it. Those habits that we made were just being honest with people, being totally transparent and just being there for them. So with those kids that are struggling, that are going through those mental health crises, um, just letting them know that they have places to go to and that we'll be completely honest with um, what we have dealt with and what they ha are going through and just being there for them. You what, know? what year are you? I'm a senior, I just graduated. Too cool, congratulations on your graduation. Thank but you. Thank you for being, thank you for pointing out I didn't see the hand up. So the reason I asked what year you are is because that organization needs to be nominated for an Iowa Character Award, because it's exactly the, the reason I say that, that's the kind of organization that needs to be uplifted. It's a great model. We talk about building awareness, and maybe that is really aware. Maybe the Ames Tribune has written a big story about that in the schools, but that's the kind of thing where young people have taken it on amongst themselves to get after and do something of exactly what you just described as I'm hearing it. So congratulations and commendation to you. You should give the next presentation here. And I'd like to learn more about that and, and what you have done because that's part of the answer too. I will tell you this, to impact young people, you need youth engagement. It's an email. Because and like, who can relate more to a teenager than a teenager? Peer-to-peer -peer youth engagement. And for to think that any, I'll speak for myself. I could not go to the Ames High School and talk to them about what they need to do better or differently. But if this young lady and her friends need to do better or differently, we need to eat lunch with these folks. We need to be there for them. We need to have it be a safe place they can come. We can talk to them in the park, whatever it is. They listen to each other. So that that's great. I could unpack that with you down the road on what habits you you created habits, right? You did things different than you'd done before. Basically, completely like changing the lifestyle. Right. 
you had a mindset of why, you probably held each other accountable to it, and you probably had some reminders of what did we say we were gonna do? Because this is all easy when it's like, oh yeah, I wanna go to the gym because I'm feeling like I wanna go to the gym. Uh, you know, when I wanna sit down and have a Coca-Cola and a box of popcorn, I don't necessarily feel that way, right? So it's a hard thing. So I, I really appreciate ad, adding that. So you have to have the mindset of why do we want to do the habits? Not why do we want to have the hard conversation? Why do we want to have the connectivity in the community? Why do we want to support the youth? So I would encourage if you are going to get people even more together, bring the youth in on that. I really appreciate both of you coming tonight, by the way. And then the accountability piece and the clarity piece. I think of the clarity piece as the bumper sticker. Like for exercise more, I think 10,000 steps. So one of the things I want to do in, in like in my work, I think about this. I, I love my job. I, I am so passionate about what I do, but I am a very focused, type A, organized, and I don't reflect that in my facial expression. I look like I'm a very serious, some would say angry, others would say other type of face that I might have. And I, I have to constantly remind myself to let my joy shine through in my face. Like I've got a prompt when I walk into my office, there's a banner that hangs, it's Governor Ray's quote, says, let your light shine. I see that banner and I smile. And it makes me think I'm going to my office and I will tell you, Deb, in our front office, if I walk in and I'm smiling and saying, how's your day going? And talk to her for two minutes is a completely different day than if I walk by with my focused face and say, good morning, Deb. So even taking that time within these things. Now I wanna talk about accountability and then I wanna to get to any other questions you have. So I'm bringing you this as a strategy, it's in your packet. Sometime in those conversations, if that were to happen, we could have even just unpacked this whole night around this. In our community in Ames, as it relates to mental health issues, what would we say we wanna stop, start, continue, or improve? Stop, start, continue, improve want to stop pointing fingers at each other. We'd like to continue to build the collaboration of there's 200 and some people that watched a session online. How do we get them more engaged? How do we get them to talk to 10 other people about it? Because then that's 2,000 people that are, and on the awareness thing, I commend you for what you've already done, but the, if it doesn't affect you necessarily, you don't see it like you do if it does affect you. So I think that there's an accountability. My point is you can use this as an, I just call it an organizational audit. This is a community assessment kind of thing, but it's not the $6,000 consultant that comes in and does surveys and focus groups and then tells you about yourself. It's you, community leaders. Go to the high school students, ask, ask them to lead this in their high school. What are the things we should stop, start, continue to improve? And I wanna be clear what I'm saying here. You can ask them about that in their high school. Ask the high school students what they think the community should stop, start, continue, or improve as it relates to a topic, mental health, food insecurity. Because guess what? A lot of those kids in these schools, I've, I've learned so much more about this food insecurity in the last six months. To think that there aren't kids coming to school every day that are hungry, you're, you're not paying attention to the awareness there is, even in Lake Wobegon, in the middle of the heartland with crops all around us. It just is an amazing thing. So there's big issues that you're working on as a community. Mental health is one of those. Ask young people, ask the high schoolers what they want, okay? Um, there's a, a format that you can do with that. Oh, I wanna show you one last video, but I'll do that at the end. It's eight o'clock, we said we go till 8.30, but we also said there's gonna be time for Q&A. So what I've tried to do is bring you within the engagement, some strategies to inspire your thoughts about how you would go about having difficult conversations around mental health. That could be a one-on-one, -on -one, it could be a community conversation. But I also, we said we wanted to leave any time for Q&A or dialogue, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that I can uh, and point you in any direction that might be there as you're thinking about where, one of the challenges questions I would have for you as I leave after this is the last session you've got scheduled on this is that I would, somebody needs to be asking what's next. That would be a question I would have for you. We've heard a couple of things tonight on that, but I'll quit talking and I'll ask any questions you've got. Thoughts, comments? Yes. I can't tell you how many times I have heard recently or said and been in conversations with, what would Bob Ray say if he were witnessing us today? Mm -hmm. 
and I'm interested that in your job, but that that, that is the, the yardstick that I hear from people yeah. of any any political ilk. Yeah. Uh, let's say we, what we need is a pathway. Right yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, come and answer your question with a thought. But sure. first, first, I want to say this because I, I I do this all the time. Can either of the two of you young people at the table tell me who Robert D. Ray was? Is that name familiar to you? You ever heard of that name? So, thank you. And that's not bad that you don't know, except that he's probably the most revered statesman governor in the history of this state. In my opinion, he was named the man of the century by the last century by the Des Moines Register. Go to college, do a research project on former Governor Robert D. Ray, you'll do great. Here's part of my point. So part of what I feel is an accountability to you talk about raise awareness is to not have the legacy of Governor and Mrs. Ray stop at the generation that knew them in leadership, but how do we inspire that knowledge of what that is in others? The last conversation of uh, what I would say was really cognitive thought processes, because Governor Ray with, and, and he, it was, you know, his obituary that he, he passed away with Louis Body's uh, Parkinson's. And um, so his, his acuteness, he still knew he loved my wife's chocolate chip cookies and wanted to know if I brought one every time I came and he knew my name. But the last conversation I had, and you may remember this, if you paid attention, I'm sure you did. There was a period um, under President Obama's administration where there were children coming from Southern countries through Mexico to the United States. And a, a, a group of them were brought to Iowa without telling our governor that they had been brought to Iowa. And the reaction was, how dare you? We can't even take care of those that are in need here and you didn't tell us these children were coming. And there was a lot of political rancor on that. And I was asking Governor Ray about this because you know the refugee relocation thing was really close and dear to his heart. I actually think it was embedded when he was in Japan right after the war of how do you treat enemies, how do you treat opponents? So here's my point. He said to me, Scott, we both have children, don't we? I said, no. Yeah. said, can you imagine when they were 8, 10, 12 years old that our lives were in such peril where we lived that we weren't sure we could even keep them safe or alive to the point that we would send them away from our love and care without knowing where they might end up or go the depth of that, how you would feel as a parent to do that. And then you start thinking about that. And then he says, and if you felt that way, how would you want them to be received when you got to the place that you had sent them to so they wouldn't have all these horrific things, including death, have to them? And it's like, oh. so I, it's just so, for me, it was very profound. And it comes back to that mindset, you know, when, when the refugee relocation, that's a big issue globally, and I love what Ambassador Quinn talks about it, Governor Ray was the only elected official at any level in the world that said we needed to do something about it when it came on the boat people side, when we'd shut down political refugees. Not, this is not the illegal, non-documented. These were refugees, political refugees the world had said we're not taking anymore. He was the only one that stood up, and that's how he ended up in Geneva with Vice President Mondale, and the world opened up its doors for more refugees. But he never saw that as a political issue. He saw it as a moral issue. He saw it as a responsibility to take care of others. And he lends that a lot on the golden rule. How would we treat people? How would we want to be treated? So I do agree with you. I will not, I cannot advocate any more equivocally about we need more people with that mindset of trying to focus on doing what's right bringing character competencies and ethical leadership. Because when people say, what do you want? They want more of Governor Ray. Many of the things they want more of Governor Ray is the character competencies and ethical leadership that's lensed with, we're gonna do the right thing for the right reason and we're going after big issues. We're going after big issues. So I do believe that if he was here in leadership, he would be talking about, we've got to talk about mental health. If he was the mayor of Ames, if he was on the council of Ames, Enough, my mic went dead. So, so I do. I, I, I'll also come back to another phrase he used a lot: is um, 
if not us, who, and if not now, when? So if, if, if well, we need more Bob Ray's, well, what does that look like for me? Can I be that person? Can I be that person in the coffee shop when somebody says something that's really cutting about somebody else and it'd be that quip and the sparkle in the eye and say, well, let's rethink how we might phrase that or even feel about that, right? So we all have some of those competencies in us. Well, it's particularly interesting as we're all refugee oriented right now and to look, he was Mr. Refugee. Yeah, and I still will tell you this, I think there's models from both the Thai Dom and the Boat People Refugee Relocation that could inform us better today of how, I mean, what happened in Iowa was a, a national and international template of refugee, okay, it wasn't always easy and it didn't always go right and well, but at least there was intentionality. And I would tell you if you want to, you know, there was connection that was made, right? Remember, I, I love this about the Thai Dom, he did not go to his friend opposing political party, but very close friend, Bill Knapp, and say, hey, do you have a complex that I can put 1,500 people in? He went to who? Iowans. Would you be willing to open your basement, your home, help these folks? And that built connections with people. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't those people. It was Jasmine, who's living in my basement. She's a delightful young girl. I use Jasmine, by the way, because that's the name Jasmine Vong. I don't know if you've seen the article or the story. Jasmine Vong, who is the daughter of a refugee, Thai Dom refugee that came in 1975. Her mother just passed away a year and a half ago with breast cancer, but she came as a refugee. She's her daughter. She's marrying Jeffrey Newland, who is Governor Ray's grandson. And when I was with him one time and somebody said, well, how did the two of you meet? Jeffrey says, well, my grandpa was responsible for that. <laughs> so it's really kind of a, a neat story. So anyway, really good point about Governor Ray. And I believe even in the most challenging times and people, we all have that inner Governor Ray. I really do. Now we need to cultivate it. We need to equip it. We need to encourage it. He used to talk about teach, encourage, advocate, and model. And the most important thing to do is model. If you want people to treat people with respect, then you should model respect. If you want to, my, my, my driving, I'm not altruistic and I'm not better than anybody else. I grew up with parents that drove the speed limit. I grew up with a grandfather that did not and he had consequences for that. So there's kind of that fear of you know not doing the right thing. My point is the modeling had a great impact. So modeling I think is good. Yes. Um. Maybe I'm alone on this, but I am fatigued with the, the polarized conversations in this country. Federal level, state level, I'm just, I'm, I'm tired of the immense polarization. And uh, I've watched families be divided and close friends and social media is, is a train wreck. And, and so I love the video that you showed. Could you give us just perhaps just one more anecdote from what you've seen, even on the state level? Because I would not hold our legislature up as a model of civility. I'm going to say that publicly. Can you give us some glimmer of hope on the state level? Yeah, um, I don't disagree with you at all about social media. And I think even there was a recent piece that just came out about the amount of screen time for younger children and it wires the brain differently. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not into, I don't understand the chemistry and physiology. I was political science and religious studies major. I should have spent more time in the sciences, but I do know the depth of the brain research and brains are wired early on in certain ways. And we're learning things about what the screen time is doing. And it's not just the screen of the social media, it's video games and all of the constant action and that. So the, the social media is a real issue. And I think uh, we do a lot of work with parenting on the character development. One of the things we're, we're working on is, you know, how do we keep parents engaged with our young people uh, in a way that it's not, you know, fly on an airplane and watch families with young people. And if this is any of you, please don't take this overly negative, but the way to keep kids calm is give them the, give them the iPad, right? And rather than direct engagement, let me talk to you. Let me. So there's all kinds of things on that side. At the state level and public 
arena. Um, I want to talk one more thing about polarization, then I'm going to come to the state. I agree with you on the polarization. I was in elementary school in Iowa in late September to speak to the parents group about character, which, as I said earlier, I don't get to do that much anymore. I'm don't get to get into schools like that. So I was very excited about this. And I followed their fundraising discussion, which ended up in a shouting match with profanities between the t-shirt group and the magazine group. The polarization of parents wanting to raise money for their school, shouting profanities to the point that if you go with t-shirts, our kids aren't going to help you at all. And the language was, I was just astounded. And then I, here I am to talk about character. And it's like that polarization is fracturing. It also, from a media standpoint, sells. Mm -hmm. So I can talk about my experience in the legislature, what I saw when I was there, but I have to tell you, I've been out 10 years. And I will tell you, the legislature has changed in the 10 years I've been out. The caucus dynamics have changed. Super majorities have an impact. Um, and there are people in the, in the Iowa legislature who have, um, I want to be cautious, I don't go a direction that's broaching any confidences. There is a member of one party that has a relationship of friendship with a member of the other party that um, that person is an attorney and they handle all of the other person's estate all of their legal planning issues because they have a level of trust and they work very well together and they found ways to disagree without being disagreeable. You will never see a news story on them. And when they do get a bill passed on a particular issue that's been divisive in the past and took bridge building of both parties to get it moved, um, that they were the two people that were able to convince enough colleagues on both sides of why this was a good thing to do. That is more rare than it used to be, but uh, it is still there. The thing I think about state level, um, any level really in governance is we are representative. We, we, we elect people that are representative of our communities. And if someone has grown up watching shouting matches on TV of the loudest person who talks over the other person as the person that's going to be right at the end of the show. And that's what they've seen and tried to demonstrate in their school and not the mock debate stuff. And they get to the Capitol and that's how they're acting. Uh, they don't tend to be as effective long term. But I, I share your concerns, but I am hopeful and I am optimistic. And I would also say this. I'll give you another example. I spoke in the state of Washington. They had 98 um, House members, and they had 23 new House members, both parties. And in their orientation, which tends to be, where do I park? How do I get my computer? I mean, you're just overwhelmed with stuff when you get elected. It's like nobody told me I was going to get thousands of pages of documents to read, and everybody wants to talk to me, and all this. You just don't know that. But in their orientation, they spent four hours on civility of how they're going to work better together. I was in Alaska five weeks ago, four weeks ago, working with the caucuses, the coalition caucuses. And there's a freshman caucus outside of the two majority and minority caucuses that's just the freshmen that have come together that they're going to do things differently in that state. Now, it's easier to do there because there's only 40. And a 21 majority is a lot different than a 51, which I served in, or whatever we have now, 63. So I do think there's pockets of things that you can point to, but they're not publicly seen as well. And what we need is more of that. You know, um, I was thrilled that Bob and Donna decided to go public with this. The other thing I would tell you that's kind of the, so there's the one backstory of Bob and Donna that, you know, my heavens, she and her wife asked him to give the eulogy. That, that's just such a powerful thing to me. At the same time, both of them, Bob would tell you this today, and she would have told you, is while this really worked for the two of them, in their organizations and their network of supporters, they had people that were really, really mad at I'm 
Bob, at Donna, and their organizations. I don't want you to have a relationship. I want the enemy. I want the issue. I don't want it solved. I want to go after somebody. And the last thing I'll tell you on this that's in my mind and the forefront of my mind is um, I think there's a lot of positive activity on the governance side of this, of civility and how we work better together organizationally as well as public service because governance is in nonprofit boards. I mean, you want to see some real bifurcating, look at nonprofit boards that aren't working well together because they've got two different directions or whatever. And what concerns me greatly, because I always felt like we were above it to a certain degree in Iowa, was our campaigning and our politics. And Governor Ray was a strong partisan. Um, good things came from differing ideas. Uh, we should have contrasts. We should have differences, but we should not tear down, dis demean, and mis misrepresent people and who they are. That's not a contrast. Um, we shouldn't hurt people. And if what we've done is come to a point of win at all costs, this agenda that I want to advance is so important, I'm willing to step outside of my natural character or integrity. I looked at this. So what's the conversation with, you have with your middle schooler the day after your election? We did all the right things well. We articulated who we were and what we wanted to do for pick your governance structure, city, county, state, nation. And it was all the right things well and the people chose somebody else. And we'll live with that. Our, we felt so important that our issues were so important. I do want you to know that we had to say a few things and do a few things that you might hear about. And I don't want you doing those in eighth grade. You can't put that kind of poster up on the locker in eighth grade about what we did. But that's why that when at all costs concerns me. The other thing that's fueling that, and somebody articulated this to me. So at the federal level, you really can't run or get elected without a paid staff to help you get there. It's become so expensive. And the difference between a candidate, and many of you have been candidates or are candidates, you know what it's like to have your name on the line when you walk in the voting booth, especially the first time, is like an awe-inspiring, oh my gosh, moment, okay? But you, it's still your name. It's still your integrity. It's still your reputation. You still have to see people at your business or in your place of worship or your community library. You've got paid staff, they're being paid to have you win. And they're more than willing to sacrifice a little bit of your reputation to do what you've paid them to do, which is help you win. So that's, so sorry to be so long winded on this, but it's, a, it's an answer that I think is really important to understand why we're seeing some of this bifurcation and polarization. When I ran for the legislature, my first term when I ran was 1998. And I was told I'd need to raise about $40,000 for a competitive primary and a competitive general election. I raised 62 and I spent 42. And at that year, I was the fifth largest money raiser in all whatever, 170 Iowa House candidates. Ron Corbett, Brent Segrist, majority speaker, majority leader, uh, Dick Meyer out of Iowa City, minority leader, Carmen Bowl in Ankeny had an open race. She raised 120 and I had 60, fifth highest. Two cycles ago, we had our first million dollar collective Iowa House race. That was the race that Peter County lost. And last cycle, there were 10 Iowa House races that were over a million dollars each for a two year, $25,000 a year citizen legislative position. And when outside elements of that, that much money and third parties get involved, I have a concern about the campaigning element impacts governance. And I saw this in legislators when I got there that were bridge builders. I mean, they were like the go-to bridge builders. And two cycles after being bludgeoned in campaigns, they were no longer a bridge builder. And then the third cycle, they got beat. Um, so sorry to be long-winded on this. It's a, I would ask you to be encouraged though. And this is why you are in a position yourself to teach, to engage, encourage, advocate, and model that. And if we really want to get after it, have a hard conversation with somebody. Another thing Governor Ray did, this, this is brilliant, he always asked people that came to him for advice for running for office. This is a little bit off topic, but you got me thinking politically now. Go and meet with your opponent. Get to know him. It's not an intel meeting. You just want to get to know him. I, of my, all of my elections, I had one that would not meet with me. 
Uh, she just did not want to meet, and that's fine. I had one that met with me early. He was a high school teacher in Johnston, Iowa, and the Sunday before the general election, he called me at 1030 at night to let me know his baby had been born. And, you know, I had young children. This was their first child. His name was Dan Scannell, went on to teach in Waterloo. We still stay connected. And that's, to me, what politics can be about that you can form relationships with. And I'll tell you, the, the, the one that I saw the greatest you talk about, Governor Ray, is Governor Ray and Bill Knapp had this. The last time I saw those two men together, they both told each other they loved each other, right? Okay? And if you looked at them from a political standpoint, but Bill Knapp still talks about it. He says, well, I like Bob Ray. He and I worked together. We got things done. Iowa was better. And so, sorry, I went a little divergent on that point for mental health. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Stay encouraged, though, right? Because if you can't be encouraged, how can you expect these young people over here to be encouraged? Any other questions, comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, I can't remember the phrase you were using. It's like the atmosphere creates the culture, or the culture creates the what was the one that you said? Um, our, the, we shape the culture. We shape the culture. The culture shapes the character. Yeah. So I'm going to answer your question. Are you? That was your question. I just wanted to know that phrase. With that in mind, I have this, I worry that as a country, we're shaping our culture to be the way that's going to describe it. Um, with the way everything's being amplified and the way everything's being shown in media, I, I want to have a career in media. This is something I think about a lot, is how can people put these messages out there to amplify these voices that further polarize on either side and so many issues. Like how do we stop this culture from yeah. being created? And how do we be an advocate for something different without being uh, a detractor? Okay. So I'm going to show you a last video I have because it's about culture shaping. And then I'm going to come back and answer your question. That'll be the last thing that we'll get ready to go. Thanks for teeing this up. We didn't talk about this. Ladies and gentlemen, at TED, we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course, you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> And here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so. Notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, but they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first and he'll get all the credit but it was really the first follower that transformed Lone Nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a Lone Nut doing something great, 
have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> so coming back to you on this, I'm concerned about our country and polarization. I'm concerned about mental health issues in Ames and how do we address those? I love the analogy of this. Who's the lone nut or a group of lone nuts wailing their arms, Governor Ray, 26 years ago, saying we should be focused on civility. People were saying, why would we do that? And then guess what? It's all this. My point is follower, right? So you could be the lone nut on this. And then you embrace that next follower. What It's really interesting if you watch, because at the end, you know, the whole hillside is dancing, because that's the in thing to do. So take that to your question about polarization. Take that to your question that I parlayed into the campaigning. What would it look like if a movement in Ames was around, you want to live in Ames, Iowa, because that's the place you can go and run for office for a school board, city council, county board of supervisors, state legislature, and you can tell them who you are and what you want to do because they don't take negative campaigning. And this mantra of negative campaigning wins, yes, guess what? Check off the box, negative campaigning loses. Most negative campaigns beat another negative campaign. And if the cost is that you're gonna be positive and lose, there's really no cost. That's my opinion, but I can walk through that. Coming back to this though, when you think about shaping culture, that took one person who was identified as the nut. I think we ought to go after mental health. I think we should get people in the same room. I think we should have the I think we should listen to the students. Look what they did at the school. That level of engagement, I'm trying to process here what we heard from this young woman into your question that preceded that about how do we get broader than just governance organizations involved, right? It's not somebody else's problem, it's all of them. That's a movement. So who's the lone nut? Who's the first follower? Underestimated former leadership. And then they brought him. Now, the other thing I'll point out, did you notice, if you look closely at that again, at the end of the three minutes, the people that are on the fringes, they're kind of doing this. Okay? But they're not sitting on the sidelines either. So you can't expect everybody to be wildly, Governor used to say, nobody will be as enthused about what you do as you are, and you better let them see that and know that. And if these are important things to you and to this community, I would challenge you, but who are the lone nuts around that? Not in a negative sense, but who's, who's leading the way that are embracing others to come along? And I think you've got two right here. I, this young lady, right? We need, I gave you my card, you get in touch with me. You've got a bright future. You guys have something here that the community can benefit from. You figured out how to do something and get beyond some of the polarization and welcome in things that were, so that's probably my biggest takeaway from today. So I'm gonna stop with that question. I'd be happy to come back anytime and visit with any of you. And I would just ask you to stay encouraged. And I would just in closing, ask you each, as you drive home tonight, you invested two hours in being here. I hope it was of value to you, but the true value is if there's at least one thing that you can come away from this that you would commit to do better or differently, in your own presence in this community. That's the value of coming to these types of things. So I thank you for the honor to speak with you and I know we'll have more conversation. So thank you very much.